today, our missions guest, I am so excited to have here. He is uh, one of my friends from a long time ago. We were youth pastors. I was youth pastor here, and he was youth pastoring over at Albany at First Assembly, now Hope Church. And so we did many, 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 many things together, played a lot of basketball together. We had a lot of good time, a lot of fun. But he is on the mission field, has been for a lot of years. And I'm so thankful to have Ken Huff back in our home here, in our church, and share with us what's going on. Will you welcome Ken to the stage today as he shares with us what God is doing in Cambodia? Thank you, sir. Good morning, everybody. Are you wide awake? Well, if you're not now, you will be soon. But it's good to see you. Good to see some friends that came this morning, too, that I haven't seen for a while. Um, in the Bible, it says, For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you know the rest of the questions that Paul then asks, right? How are they going to call on somebody whom they've never believed? And how are they going to believe in him for whom they've never heard? Sometimes because we live in our a little American world where we've had all sorts of Jesus stuff around us for a long time, we find it hard to fathom that there's places on our planet that have never heard about Jesus. But there are still lots of places that have never yet been served the good news. Some had been served sometimes long ago, but after Islam and some of that closed the doors and they haven't heard for the last five, six, seven, eight hundred years in those places as well. Whether it be in North Africa, whether it be in the Middle East, or in a part of the world where I'm at in Asia, how can they call upon somebody in whom they never believed? How do they believe if you've never ever heard about who Jesus is. But the next question, of course, is how will they hear unless there's a preacher? And that's where people like myself and others that say, Lord, here am I, send me, come into the picture. To leave where we've been, where we grew up, where we're comfortable, and to go to a place with a new language and a new culture and learn the language and learn the culture so that they can hear about who Jesus is. Literally in Cambodia, when I got there, most people had never, ever, ever even heard the name, the historic name of Jesus. Let alone what he did, who he was, and what he taught. Literally, they had not heard the historic name of Jesus because of things that had transpired in their recent history, that those who had heard some were mostly killed. And so I would ask things like, do you know Jesus? And the word for Jesus is Yesu. And they'd look at me like, what in the world are you talking about? And they'd say, I know a lot of grandmas, but I don't know Grandma Sue. Because the word yay means grandma, yesu, and su means endurance. And so in their mind, because they'd never even heard the name, all they could associate was I was saying, do you know grandma endurance? And that's what it's like in Cambodia it was and where it is like in many parts of our world still. And so people say, here my Lord, send me and you go so that people can hear that have never heard, so they can call upon the name of the Lord. But the next question is just as important. And what is it? And how shall they go unless they're sent? And I want to say to you today, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because I cannot go to Cambodia and live and learn language and build relationships and understand culture Unless there are people like you that say, I believe in reaching the lost as well. Maybe I'm not the one that's going to go to Cambodia or to Thailand or Vietnam or to some of these places, but God can help me to help them to be able to go. And this church has been a partner 
and close friend from way back when, but has been supporting me so that I can live in Cambodia for over the last 24 years. Together with other churches, I'm not sure if you really know how it works sometimes, other churches in Oregon primarily that give faithfully, it blows me away, faithfully, month after month after month, this church, other churches send money that is given through faith promises and different things, and I've been able to live in Cambodia so that I can bring the gospel to people and help to start a church in a place where there was no church ever before. And the people who had never, ever heard the historic name of Jesus can know the real Jesus and have their lives transformed and find hope. But it comes from you, too, that we're in this together, and not just the giving, but the praying. And you'll find when you leave, I got this, my ugly mug on it, and some of Cambodia, so that you can remember to pray for myself and for the people of Cambodia. And there's other countries on the back. Please pray Vietnam, Laos, Thai, all places that most people have never, ever, ever heard the gospel before. And out there too is just pray for Cambodia, but it's really, there's a movement now that we're trying, that the Buddhist world is kind of forgotten. The church world has started to pray and we're thankful for it a lot for the Muslim world that needs the gospel. But the Buddhist world is huge that has not been penetrated with the gospel yet. And so this is a way that you can find more information online and do things and be involved in praying and understanding about what's going in the Buddhist world as well. And so thank you. Today I'm not going to preach a normal sermon, and I'm sorry for those that have listened to me a time or two before in other places, but I have preached every five years. Actually, this church, has like, it's been like 2007 since I've been in a service to share, I do believe. I preach, but your pastor knows how to preach about missions. He has a passion for missions. But I can share with you what God's been doing. And again, I hope that you will say, this isn't like Ken and he's bragging about, this is God and this is what I've been a part of through my prayers for Cambodia, for Ken, and for my giving to the missions in this church that has helped me to be able to be there. Because God is alive and doing awesome things in our world. Sometimes, again, we live in America and we get defeatist because we kind of see what's happening around us and forget that God's alive and he's still building his church and wants to do it here and is doing it around the world. Now, one of the things I've been involved in from just about the time I got to Cambodia is Bible school. And one of the classes I teach there is church history. I love church history for a lot of reasons. But in church history, I end up teaching about the different waves and different times and different places on our planet that received the gospel and places that were transformed by the gospel. In some places, it's been 2,000 years plus. And then you get to places that it was six and it was 1,400 years ago, 1,500 years ago in Northern Europe and some of those places that received the gospel. And you move into some of the other things that happened after exploration coming to the Americas and then to what was the Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening and how that spurred the Protestants to finally start going to share the gospel where it had not been before, to get behind the Great Commission in lots of places. And that's been going on for well over 100 years now. But I always get to Cambodia because I want my students to understand their own church history. But with Cambodia, church history is like living history. Almost anybody that's been a major player in the church that's in Cambodia now is still alive. And they're my friends. So sometimes I bring them in to share about different things and about the refugee camps and how they share their... It's alive. Because the gospel is so new to Cambodia. Go ahead and start the slides if you want to. And I'm just going to talk through some of what God has done that you've been a part of too. The gospel was there, but in 1975, the Khmer Rouge took over. After five years of civil war. During that time, they killed pretty much anybody that had any kind of education. And what little church there was, was pretty much wiped out. And then came the Vietnamese occupation with the Russians over the next 10 years. 
And then came 1990 when the doors started to open a little, but it was still illegal to meet together to do it. There were maybe two to 300 Christians alive in the country. Over the next eight or nine years, while much war was still going on, early missionaries started to lead this person and that person to Christ and start to disciple them. Well, for the Assemblies of God, one of the keys always is Bible school. Train up nationals to do the work of ministry, to build a national church that can carry on. So when I moved there in the beginning of 99, there were hardly any believers yet, but a start. There was a foundation laid by the early missionaries. Well, God's plan, I ended up living at our Bible school. And through that, not only teaching, but getting to build relationship because discipleship is just not taught, it's caught, right? And so I got to spend time and know every single student that went through during the last 24 years and call them friends. And so I spend much of my time being out and about and getting to share in their churches and encourage them as well as continue to change trade new students. This is one of the most awesome things that has transpired. About two years ago, that young man that you just saw a minute ago became the first Cambodian director of the Bible school. No longer us, but training up people to do the work of ministry. Well, he and his friends that are now other Bible schools in Phnom Penh recently got together. And this is pictures from that gathering, and it's awesome. All six Bible schools in Phnom Penh now have Cambodian directors, and they love each other, and they want the young people that are Bible school students to love each other as well. The old people tend to fight with each other. We want the young people to love each other. One of the awesome things was, how many Christians were alive 30 years ago in Cambodia? Maybe two to 250, right? In this picture, just six Bible schools together for fellowship was 250 Bible school students. God is doing awesome things. Go ahead and move forward. Well, one of the things we saw is that most people, though, that become Christians and want to help in the body of Christ can't go to a residential Bible school. It just can't leave your work and your home and things. And we have, in lots of villages, home churches and things like that. And we saw that we were training the top leaders, but there wasn't anybody to support them, anyone to do children's, anybody to do youth, anybody to be board members. And so thank God for Light for the Lost and Men's Ministry that gave money, and we translated all 18 books that are in the Christian Life program of ICI. And now we have these 18 classes that are in the Cambodian language that we go out to different provinces around the country and do classes for two days every two months. In a three-year period, they get to go through all 18 books. And so you're seeing some of these people, young to old, that want to be leaders, that want to know the word better, that have been trained receiving some of their certificates. And so starting to build so that they know, so that they can help other people as well. Go ahead and move forward. We also had the Full Life Study Bible, some know as the Fire Bible, translated into the Cambodian language. Cambodian language takes up a whole lot more room than English does. So it's this big, big book. But we found as we were getting it out to pastors that it was just sitting around because who's going to carry that thing? And they didn't understand at all how to use the tools in a study Bible. And God laid in my heart, you need to do workshops for the top leaders and then around the country to help them to know how to use the tools. They'd never seen a cross reference. They'd never seen a footnote. They'd never seen study notes or any that's in this book, but they don't know how to use it. And you're seeing here, these are the national leaders now of the Assemblies of God. And we did a two-day workshop with them, and they know how to use it now. And then they are now, through your help, because it's all money from Oregon, going out to the six different regions of our country to do workshops and give these Bibles out so that pastors actually have some tools to use when they're getting ready to do their sermons. It's not like English where you can just go on the internet and figure out this and that. It's not a bunch of books in the library. And now they got this tool. I can't tell you how many times now that I've been in some of our churches and the people say, wow, our pastor's so much better than he used to be. He used to preach the same sermon, just different stories each week. And it was because of what? Because all of a sudden they had this study Bible with notes, with cross references, with all these things to help them better understand for themselves and to teach to other people as well. And so thank you. Go ahead and move forward. Some time ago, 
well, as a youth pastor, and we used to use Book of Hope on occasion. When God opened up doors at South Albany, West Albany, and the other schools there, we had Youth Alive Club start. Well, the kids could give out the word we couldn't. And so we partnered with what was called Book of Hope, which is basically the synoptic gospels in form where they don't put anything in twice but don't leave anything out, but it's the word of God from the gospels. And God laid in my heart, get that done in the Cambodian language. And so I started to partner with the Bible Society of Cambodia to get the Book of Hope, the word of God, which does not return void, into the Cambodian language. And God started to open up doors in some of the public schools for us to get it out. And all of a sudden, we were be able to get it. And again, the big purpose was they'd never even heard the name of Jesus. And those who did were so confused about who he was. But I knew if they would read for themselves, they would love who Jesus was and what he taught. Well, God laid in my heart to talk to this girl here, who was one of our only youth leaders in the country, was a 16-year-old youth leader, and say, would you help to run this? What an incredible thing is she sacrificed much to become the head of One Hope but full of ideas, training other people, being involved. She's now during COVID. I mean, she did so many workshops online through Zoom and different kind of things. She's so much more creative than I ever could be. She came up with another idea, brush your teeth. And she started getting toothbrush cheap out of Vietnam from money from Oregon churches and giving them out. And at the same time, then giving out the book of hope, the word of God to young people. Well, the Ministry of Education saw this, and they said, we will give you a letter that gives you permission to go to any public school in the country to give out your books if you'll just teach them to brush their teeth. Most people never had a toothbrush. Of course, one of the sad things, less when we gave it to them, if they only got one, the whole family used that one toothbrush. And so it's grown and grown so that now she, instead of giving books out herself, she trains children's workers, trains youth leaders, and enables them so that they can go to the schools in their part of the country, give them out, and then do follow-up and start youth groups and start children's group around the country. And God has been awesome. Almost two million books now have been given out in public schools across Cambodia. See these here? When they come to Cambodia, who's in charge of them? She's in charge of them. Who helps to do it? The people she's training. And with these, the book of hope, because just gifts are not going to change anybody's life, but the word of God has power to change people's lives. And they have the book of hope that goes out with these Christmas boxes as well. The old guys were messing things up, and so it's now our national youth director and our head of One Hope that run Christmas Child in Cambodia. But again, training leaders to follow up because it does no good to give out gifts if there's nobody to follow up. What they've started recently is an intern thing. For some of you that knew Master's Commission, it's a little like that, but it's only three months long. Kids from across the country, not kids, young adults, that want to gain ministry experience can put their name in. She interviews and then chooses eight students every three months to be interns for One Hope, where they learn about ministry and what it is and how that they can help to train others, and they learn how to take the books, give them out, into the, the schools across the country and do follow up with them as well. And so continue to pray. It's called Cultivate. Go ahead and move forward. One of the other things, what was the time that kids were really changed at camps? Whether it was Davidson for winter camps, we went to a lot of camps, three winter camps, three summer camps, and Salt. How many went with me to Salt, Hungry Horse, Montana? My life was changed there too. But I knew that camps were awesome because it was time where you were away from the norm where you could seek God and hear from God. And so God laid in my heart, do youth camps. There wasn't even a youth department. There wasn't even youth groups. There was nothing yet. The churches didn't even know each other. And God laid in my heart to do it. And it was kind of an Oregon team that helped kick it off. We had youth from Albany, not from Albany, from Oregon. Some were Albany. Come. And when they came, 25 students from Oregon, I invited two students from each of our only 13 churches at the time that knew some English, and that wanted to do ministry. And they came and worked together with the Oregon kids. And one month later, some of those students that now loved each other and knew each other from around the country helped me do our first youth camp for Cambodia. And so thank you, Oregon and Oregon youth that came and set an example so we could do it. At the youth camp, we do lots of stuff, discipleship things, 
things so that they can build relationships with other young people, but evening services, we only get to do, allow them to do three things. No games, no all sorts of weird stuff. It's worship, the word, and respond to God. And I wish you could be there when there's 250, 300 kids from across the country coming together to worship God and to hear his word and respond. Every time we do it, the last night of camp is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is so much fun to watch people get baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's like Acts that you say, have you ever heard of the Holy Spirit? Never heard of it. And God filling them with the power and high. And they're going back to their homes and their churches changed. And their pastors, their parents say, what happened to my kid? They're no longer the same as they were before. It's the presence and power of God. Go ahead and move forward. But one of the awesome, other awesome things at a camps was training leaders. We got to train leaders. We got to train leaders. And so these are the ones that helped me with the very first camp. But one of the great decisions that God led us to was invite 16 young adults or young marrieds to be team leaders in each camp. Each one of those leaders will be responsible for 20 campers as we do different things. And so you're seeing some of the different years where we had 16 leaders that would be responsible for 20 students each to put into their lives. Well, we would take these people away, these 16, for several other days just to train them in kind of youth ministry and ministry in general and how they could be effective during camp and then after. Well, from that now, we are starting district youth departments. And you're seeing here, these is a training for district youth leaders for Phnom Penh and Kaikandao and those around there. This is for a whole region that has a bunch of different provinces in it that each province sent people to come be trained to be district youth leaders. This then, I would see who's got ability, who's faithful, and started taking some of our top leaders to Philippines every third year for what they would do as a youth and college ministry training for all of Asia. That girl right in the middle in the blue shirt, back up just a second if you can. It's so awesome, the stories. This was a number of years back, and she was a representative from Vietnam that was there. Well, that girl, go ahead and move forward, that's in the middle there. She ended up translating the fire Bible into the Vietnamese language. While she was doing that, she married a guy from America, and they are now back in Cambodia as missionaries reaching Vietnamese people in Cambodia. But also, go ahead and move forward. From that group that went and studied with me, God started to show who would be the leaders. And we now have the National Youth Department of the Assemblies of God of Cambodia. Zero Christians before. Now we have a youth department that I hardly have to do anything. It's great, Kevin. Now I just go play with the kids at camp and have fun. And when it gets too late, I just go to my room and sleep because you raise up leaders to replace you. And this is the leaders for across Cambodia. Go ahead and move forward. So, I'm a young man there. That is 24 years ago. And look at those kids. See the one with my left that's sitting on my lap. Remember her for later. So people tend to think, oh, you have an orphanage. No, I have never been in charge of an orphanage. But the Assemblies of God, at the request of the Cambodian government, had an orphanage. Because there were so many kids that were left orphaned from AIDS and from the war and different things going on. Babies after babies we had early on. Well, they start to grow up. I would go down to the orphanage, though, whenever I had free time from language school because Cambodia has so many holidays. And so who better than to practice with kids because they don't talk in big words and they're not so critical and things. And so I learned a lot of Cambodian from talking to the kids at the orphanage. There were about 150 of them at the time. Well, they start to grow up and they graduate from high school. The guy that did oversee the orphanage said, we need to help them. The universities are in Phnom Penh, which is three hours away from the orphanage was. Ken, let's rent some place in Phnom Penh so they have a place to live and we will find help for them to go to universities. And so they started, but one year into it, he leaves the field. So guess who got him? I know them all since they were little because I'd go down and visit and hang out and chat with them. And so for the next 10, 12 years, I had two kind of apartment dorm kind of places right next to my house. And for four years at a time, we would get to invest in these young people, be with them. They became known themselves as the big family because they stayed together, but they got an education. Well, now they're all starting to get married, different things. I've been a father 17 different times. I got three more times coming up real soon because in a Cambodian wedding, the parents are more important than the bride and groom. 
So they can't get married without a father. So who do they ask me? I say I have 17 ex-wives because I have no wife. I'm single. So they just choose another lady, a teacher, to be my wife for the day. So don't take that wrong. I don't really have ex-wives, okay? So back up just a little bit here, like two, three, right there. So now we've helped it. This is now, he is a doctor in Cambodia. Most doctors don't want to make anybody better. They want to make money, but he cares. His wife that he married is a nurse. Go ahead and move forward. This girl here was studying. That's Dr. Neil that's from Stan Neil that's in this area. He was over with the medical team, but part of the medical teams, the good was training young people, giving them a vision that they can help others. That girl in that picture is now a doctor and helping many people in the rural areas of Cambodia. This young man in the middle, he became an architect. Then he became a contractor. Go ahead and back up just a little. And he has helped to build a Christian hospital, two international schools, and all sorts of churches in Cambodia. Go ahead and move forward. This girl is the queen, I call her, because for the last 12 years, she's been the secretary or assistant for the Assemblies of God Cambodian. We all know the secretary is the boss, and she's the one who gets things done. Her husband's actually the son of a pastor as well. Go ahead and move forward. The one girl that's standing real close to me, that's the girl that was sitting on my lap before. But she's my accountant, that we have a teacher, we have another teacher right there, and another girl that's a business administrator for one of our churches. Go ahead and move forward. We got all sorts of them. And so in this picture, one girl helps to run a women's center. The other one's a teacher. We got teachers. That's like eight different teachers. It's okay. Let them fly forward. Go ahead. Like eight different te- um, picture people in that are from our orphanage that are now teachers. But they love Jesus. They're not just doing their vocation, but they're loving Jesus and involved in their churches as well. Some then, after they got their degrees, went to Bible school. And here's two of the guys that are in full-time ministry as well. The two there, that the white shirt and the pink shirt are married to each other, both from the orphanage, and they are now the national youth directors for the Assemblies of God Cambodia. They're in the Philippines getting their master's in theology so they can come back, teach at the Bible school, do the national youth ministry, and also pastor. Go ahead and move forward. So, other thing been involved in, the government wanted us to help with schools when we got there because lots of places had no school buildings and therefore no kids were going to school in those areas. And through partnering with what was Mission of Mercy at the time, now it's called One Child Sponsorship, we were able to build buildings and help kids, whether poor or super poor, because there was no rich, get to go to school. You're supposed to be able to go to school for free, but that's just not how it works. If you don't give your teacher something, then you don't get a go. Well, at our schools, they get a go. And we help them so they go. And it just raises everybody in the community when you help them. But the awesome thing is, because we help in these schools, the government lets us teach Bible once a week for an hour. We got more freedom than you got around here. And these kids start hearing from kindergarten on about who Jesus is and studying the word, and many are becoming believers. And now, where we had zero zero Christians when we started, we now have about 60 churches in the different villages that are around that feed these schools. The teams that helped me the most, medical and teaching English. They need to know English because it's the language of both government and of tourism and of uh, commerce in Asia. How does somebody from Thailand work with Vietnam? English. How does Japan work with Korea? English. And so we try to help them because it's part of the curriculum, but they don't have good English teachers. So these teams come. What an awesome thing. Can you imagine being a little kid out in a rural school, and all of a sudden you got Americans in your classroom helping you with pronunciation and helping with English? What an incredible help, but also the relationship, and for them to get to hear about Jesus and see example of Jesus. So maybe someday Lebanon can bring a group over and stay, because all of you, most of you speak English, right? I mean, you got an Oregon accent, but you're okay. But it can help through teams. Go ahead and move forward. So we saw what happened with the dorm we had with the orphans. I thought, what an incredible thing, because lots of our kids from rural areas were coming to university, and they were being forced to live with family members that were Buddhist and wouldn't let them allow them to continue to follow Christ. And so God laid in my heart, and again, with your help and support, we rented four places across Phnom Penh connected to churches. I never want to do anything that doesn't involve the local church for them to help the disciple and our kids to be involved in that as well. But again, then, for four years at a time, 
we get these university students that love Jesus and we get to do discipleship right there. We're, I'm doing a special once a year thing on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all sorts of other training that's going on in their lives. But the awesome thing is instead of leaving Christ, they're following closer than ever and are involved in incredible ministry. Most of them go through the Christian Life series that I told you as well, that each Saturday they give up their time to go and study in the Christian Life program so that they can have a better knowledge of the Bible. But the awesome thing is they help in their churches, but they also go back to their villages to help and now are helping to plant churches in the outskirts of Phnom Penh as the city grows. All these pictures you're seeing right now involves these young college students that work full-time, go to school full-time, involved in their own churches, and volunteer every Sunday afternoon to go do outreaches and to plant churches in the outskirts of Phnom Penh. What an incredible thing that you're a part of. And I mean, look at that. And what's taking place is they do do children's ministry here if you're not. And not just for a few. Get out into your community and find ways that you can share because most people who come to Christ are going to come while they're kids. It don't work just in Cambodia. And there's kids here growing up that don't know a thing about Jesus. And who's going to do it? You're going to do it. But these young people are helping to plant the church where it hasn't been before. Go ahead and move forward. Teen Challenge. About 18 years ago, a man that was a Cambodian-American that had fled the Khmer Rouge, he had made decent money, and he went to Cambodia, and he saw these kids that were on the streets that were hooked on glue. Their pimps or handlers kept them on glue so they'd be skinny and pliable and easy to sell for sex and things like that. Well, he saw that and he said, I want to help start Teen Challenge so that these kids can get off drugs and have a future. And so he helped us with a lot of funding and different things to get a Teen Challenge Boys and Men Center going. And it's just doing awesome. The problem is people don't like to give to help boys. You say trafficking and girls, whoa, they'll throw money at you. Even though it's stupid, most of it. I live there, I can say that. But for boys... People don't say, oh, they kind of see boys as the ones that aren't the victims somehow. And so the Teen Challenge lost all of its funding over time for the boys. And so God laid in my heart, and you probably remember, to send out to churches, to individuals saying, this is one that's important for us for the ministry it does, but also the government, that's part of how we get recognized and have our visas is because they have a lot of drug problems, and so they want things like Teen Challenge. And I said, we're getting ready to renew our MOU, but we need funding for three years, and we have zero. But I am so thankful that Oregon churches, individuals in Oregon, people that I know, and Pacific Northwest Teen Challenge said, I'll give a month, I'll give a month, I'll give a month, I'll give a month. And we were able to cover 22, 2023, and we've covered one month of 24 out of that. But I will continue to say, It's $4,500 for a month. Maybe it's something this church could do in 2023 and say, we'll work together to do a month for the Teen Challenge in Cambodia. But continue to pray. Look, it's really teens, isn't it? And those street kids, we can't just stick them back on the streets when they're done. So we end up taking care of them during middle school and high school until they get done as well. One of them now is a Bible school student at the pictures you saw earlier. Go ahead and move forward. So part of the privilege I had living at the Bible school, all the leaders are my friends. I've been there 24 years. The gospel's only been there 30-something, 31 years. So what you see here is their national leaders in our very first orientation service. Well, because none of them have ever been ordained, they had me help to ordain because I'm ordained. And that is the national leaders of the Assemblies of God of Cambodia and the Bible school teacher and one that runs a different organization. This is when we went out to do some church dedications together as well. The vision of the national leaders, and that's our district leaders, is one church in every province that's a mother church. There's 26 cities and provinces. We want to see a church planted in every single one that can then help to plant them and mother them in other places as well. And so pray for these guys. They've never been a district leader before. They've never even seen a district leader before. And they all do it as volunteers. And so pray as we're trying to train and give them vision to help because servant leadership is a very new concept. The bigger you are, the more people should serve you. 
And in Cambodia, we want them to see that Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. And so pray that that would become a part of their heart is that they want to help and they want to invest in younger leaders as well. Go ahead and move forward. One of the other things I've been involved in for more than 20 years is I'm the coordinator for the Assemblies of God for Cambodia. And partly what that means is I coordinate our different missionaries. But part of the fun is it's not just American missionaries. This is one of the first places in the world because the gospel is so new that the Assemblies of God from Australia, New Zealand, from uh, Sweden, from Finland, from others, work together from Canada to form one Assemblies of God instead of having a whole bunch of little ones somewhere that have allegiance to different countries. But now, some of our best workers are from the Philippines, have been for a while. I know it's hard for us to imagine, but Philippines is one of the biggest mission-sending countries in the world now. This is the new move, and God is doing awesome things, Latin America. How many of you have been giving to missionaries in Latin America for most of your life? Right? This church has too. Well, has God done things in Latin America? I'm telling you, the church is stronger there than it is here. And what should happen with a church as it matures? They quit taking from other countries, and they start sending to countries that don't have the gospel yet. And so I'm getting to fund. These are El Salvadorian missionaries. That one of the first places God allowed me to take a missions team from Oregon when I was running it here, El Salvador. They have now sent me three units that are awesome missionaries that are going to three different provinces where there is no church to plant the church. Pray for them. Those ones are way up by Vietnam and by Laos. The one that's on the right has just moved to a very hard to reach place on the way to the Thai border. This is just within the first couple months of them moving there to start to plant the church. This is just within that month or two of where they're at up near the borders of Laos and Vietnam. Now, one of the other ones I went in 98 with the AIM trip from Oregon was Bolivia. Well, Bolivia has sent us a pastor for 25 years. He was a pastor. He's learned to take trash and turn it into treasure, and he uses that to go share the gospel and to help people in the slums down in the southern part of Cambodia. What's he given out besides that? The Book of Hope. God using all these different kind of things to do it. And so Latin America, this is just some of the ones. This girl from El Salvador went to a place we didn't have it, and she started ministry. Mostly who came were children. I want you to know, her home group leaders that went to other villages were sixth graders. Do any of you know your Bible better than a sixth grader? What are you doing with it? They would go, and these sixth graders would help to lead other children to Christ. Now you're looking at them. Ten years later, when they're dedicating a church that, again, Oregon helped the seed money to get that church going and to be built, and now the leaders are teenagers and 20s and helping to do incredible ministry in that place. One is now the children's director for the Assemblies of God in Cambodia, and it was El Salvadorian missionaries that did this. That's just one of their dedication services about a year ago. Go ahead and move forward. So one of my fun these days is, because of our uniqueness and what I've been involved in and working with missionaries from like 15 different countries, they asked me to be on the World Assemblies of God Missions Commission because most of the other people were from countries that want to send and they wanted somebody that was on the receiving end to be a part. What a fun thing to be a part of this because the big goal of this group is encourage and help the developing world, that the church is strong to be senders. Not to think that they're too poor to do missions, but that every 10 churches would send one missionary out of Latin America and out of Africa particular and Eastern Europe, where the God is doing awesome things in Romania and Hungary and some of those places that used to be under the Soviet Union. Not real long ago, I was in Madrid as they had a meeting. Not long ago, three years ago. When you're old, not long ago is three years sometimes. It was sad. It was exciting. It's a dedication service for new missionaries that are going to go to places around the world. Every last one of these pastors got up and apologized. They apologized. I'm like, and they would say this, I'm so sorry that I don't have a big budget And so I can't do wells, and I can't do feeding centers, and I can't rescue anybody, and I can't do this, and I can't do that. And I thought, how sad it is that over the last 20 years, we've taught 
the developing world that missions is the UN work we do. The touchy-feely, what makes us feel good stuff. But then the exciting part. And they said, I don't have all that stuff and I don't have a big budget, but what I have is the word of God, faith, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I said, come on, give me that any day. I don't want that other stuff. Give me people that will go plant the church and make disciples. And it's an awesome thing to be a part of. Go ahead and move forward. And so just three weeks ago, I was in Colombia at a rally at a meeting of all the different countries in Central and South America and some of the Caribbean and some of Africa getting together said, we can do this. We're going to believe God to start to send more and more missionaries out of our countries. This is just some of the representatives that were, what a fun thing to be with 2,000 people that their passion is to reach the lost. And it says, speed is coming. And basically what that means is, this gospel shall be preached to all ethnos, to all people, and then the end shall come. And they said, there's a lot of places that I haven't heard yet. We're done sending to other Spanish-speaking places. We're done sending just in our country. God, send us to places that haven't heard yet so that all ethnos, all people can receive the gospel. I'm telling you, the next big wave of missionaries isn't going to be America. We should keep up what we're doing. Korea should keep up what they're doing. Canada should keep up. But I'm telling you, God is preparing to send out a mighty army from the Latin America church that is so strong and from Africa in the parts that are so strong as well. Just look at some of these numbers. Sometimes we're living in the 1940s or something and think that Africa and South America are the mission field. Well, they have people that aren't saved, but so does Oregon. But they got the gospel and they got strong churches. Look at some of these places. Argentina, 2100. This is just assemblies of God. Not the kingdom of God. There's a whole lot more when you think the kingdom of God. Brazil, 124,000 Assembly of God churches. Just think, if every 10 churches get together and send one missionary from just Brazil. El Salvador, super strong church that is sending missionaries all over 2,000 plus churches. Guatemala, 3,000. Mexico, 5,000. Peru, 4,000. And then you get to Africa and look at some of these numbers, just assemblies of God, and say, I've been a part of this. If you've been giving and praying for missions in Africa and Central Latin America, God has heard your prayers. And I hope you'll pray that God will continue to develop the church and they will send missionaries. Ghana, where we're going to have our next meeting to rally the troops, almost 3,000 churches. Burkina Faso, 5,000. Kenya, over 10,000. Mozambique, that's only been open 30 years after the communist revolution, over 6,000 just Assembly of God churches in that country, Portuguese speaking, but that they would send them out. Nigeria, 16,000. Tanzania, 76. Uganda. Why are we sending to Uganda? They have over 10,000 churches and they want to stand up and say, I can do this. I don't need Western stuff. We're going to take the gospel to other places as well. And so I just want to encourage you. God's doing awesome things around the world. Continue to pray and particularly pray that every 10 churches, that they'll quit saying we're too poor. The Assemblies of God was super poor when they started. That's why we're around as the Assemblies of God. Said you can't send them, I can't send them, together we can send them. And that the churches in these other countries will get together and say we can do it with the help of God and send people to help to reach the places that have never been reached before. And so again today, I hope you're encouraged with what God's doing around the world. You, what you've been a part of, that's just 25 years that you just saw in Cambodia. And the church, instead of 200 people, is well over 300,000 people. And again, it's not the kingdom of assemblies of God. God's doing it through all sorts of groups. Some of our best missionaries are Korean Presbyterians, because Presbyterian there are passionate about Christ and sending as well. And so continue to pray. And I just want to challenge you as you're doing your faith promises, believe God for big things. Help more people to get to places where the gospel's not yet so that we can train up nationals to do the work of ministry and then them help to reach other people as well. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we love you so much and are so thankful that you allow us to be a part of what you're doing. That you don't just do it yourself, but that you chose to work through us as you did with your early disciples and to use us and to give us the privilege 
to be able to build your kingdom and to share with others. I pray for this church that you would give them new ideas, new creative things, and new passion to be a light for their neighbors, for their homes, and for people around them, that the church would grow here in reaching children and young people and old people across this area and this community as well. The Lord, too, that you would use them to pray and to give, to help to reach our world as well. Help us all just to be faithful and committed to you, remembering this is not our home. We're just passing through. We don't want to store everything up here, but we want to store and lay up things in heaven where we'll be forever with you. And I just ask this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Thanks amen. so can you much put, for letting me share. Can you put your hands together for Ken? Thank you, Ken. That is a lot of work done in 24 short years. God has been good, and it began through our support of one missionary who went. And isn't that amazing? You know, somebody asked me, why do you need these? I hope you understand why now. Because our support each month goes to more than just putting a house over a missionary's head. It goes into outreach. It goes into training. It goes into equipping. It goes into changing a country from having 250, 200, 250 Christians to having over 300,000 Christians in just a couple of decades. That's what this does. I want to challenge you as I did last week. You've been giving for years. Many of you have been supporting for years, and I'm so thankful for you, and I'm so thankful for your heart and your desire to continue to do that. The question I asked you last week is, would you consider doing more? Some of you know what you've been giving. Would you consider doing more? Maybe some of you have never given before. I just challenge you, start somewhere. Start at $2 if you can afford $2 in your budget. Start at 5 For some, it may be 10 20 30 50 It may be $100. Start somewhere if you've never given to missions before. Start somewhere. It doesn't matter the amount. If God's telling you to do it, do it. But then you also have to consider if you've already been giving, what is God challenging you to do beyond what you've been giving? Can you do more? Can you help us reach more? This is just one country, one missionary out of all that we support. Can you do something more? I just want to challenge you in that. Stand with me today as we close. Thank you so much, Ken. Great to hear this report. Man, I'm, in, I'm encouraged. And the, the thing that I want to, to say to us today is this. One, it is fantastic what is going on in another country. But you realize that's happening because somebody got saved and wanted to tell somebody else about it, right? That's why it has grown from what it is to what it is today in Cambodia. I just hope and pray we can capture the heart of that for our own community as well. Because we have a mission field. It's easy to throw money. It's easy to give money. It's, for some reason, super hard to walk across the street or around the corner and tell somebody about Christ. I want to challenge you. Missions isn't just around the world. It's across the streets. Let me close in prayer. So, God, I thank you for this fantastic report of what God is you're doing in this ministry that we support in Cambodia. Man, I'm encouraged, Lord. And, and, and so, God, I just pray that we can capture that here. Lord, that it can begin to happen in our community, that we can begin to see our passion for you uh, just growing like it is in the lives of others. God, that we would, we've served you and loved you for years, but God, sometimes that causes the fire to dwindle, and I pray that you will reignite within us a passion for souls in our own community, in our own neighborhoods, in our own jobs, that, God, we would be your voice. We would be your witness. We would share our stories with others around us because, Lord, you have done great and victorious things in our lives. So today as we leave, Lord, let us be encouraged. Let us be uh, challenged and let us move forward in doing what it is you have for us to do this week and each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 